Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Abi Sridi. I'm a quantitative analyst at Salasians um, and also in charge of the Python lectures in the MLI program. Uh, I'm so excited to introduce our panel, which uh, comprises a blend of expertise and experiences uh, in the fields of uh, AI, technology, and um, finance. So we are joined by distinguished panelists. Um, so first, I'm pleased to welcome back um, Said Amin and Ryan Siegler. Um, uh, they are joined um, by uh, Dr. Paul Billiken. Uh, could you introduce yourself? Uh, yes, so I have been um, uh, in finance since about 2005. I've been um, at various um, sell side, buy side, and high frequency trading institutions, as well as different kinds of uh, fintechs as well. And uh, I'm also a visiting professor at Imperial College. And last but not least, I'm a uh, head of faculty at MLI, and I'm head of faculty at QDC. Thank you. Uh, we are also joined by Professor Blanca Hoveth. Uh, could you please introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Blanca Horvath. I'm an associate professor in Oxford. I also teach in the MLI and a uh, long-time um, collaborator of the gentleman here. Thank you so much. Um, we are also joined by Dr. Olga uh, Petrova. Could you please introduce yourself? Hi, uh, I'm Olga Petrova. Um, sorry, I don't have the video on at this time. Um, so I'm a computer, I'm a quantum physicist by training, and eventually that led to a switch to deep learning. Um, I was working as a machine learning engineer for a while, then a product manager in AI, and currently I work as a consultant in AI R and D uh, and product. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, as a moderator, I encourage you to participate uh, actively um, answering your questions, um, either from our audience here in person or uh, for those uh, joining us online. They can just post their questions in the chat. Uh, so let's uh, start with the first question. Uh, okay, so on the chat, I've got some questions for Ryan. Um, so Frederick um, Cibulet is asking, uh, what's the typical dimension of the vector space for text, for sounds, and for image, uh, for video? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. And, and actually, there's not a standard for that, uh, but it depends on the embedding model that you that you use uh, for your application. So. Um, in fact, you know, you have embedding models that can take text uh, specifically, or you could have embedding models that can take images specifically. Uh, but like I mentioned, uh, one thing that I believe we're going to start seeing more of is embedding models that can take uh, different modalities of data, different types of data, and put those all into the same embedding space. Um, so depending on the model, there will be different dimensions uh, for you to choose from. Yeah, he's also asking if uh, we can compare and contrast uh, tokenization and vectorization. Yeah, so tokenization is uh, basically taking uh, the text that you're inputting and breaking that into smaller chunks that are more easily understandable by machine learning models. And vectorization is taking your entire uh, chunk of text, for example, and representing that whole thing as a vector embedding, uh, where the vector embedding tells you all of the information about the semantic meaning of the entire piece of text. So uh, a little bit different there. Thank you. So uh, Jean Thomas is asking, uh, what does MetaVerb really do? Uh, if it does, uh, does it build a cross stream audio video metadata? So uh, the metadata, re really all it is, is it's data that describes other data. So like if you thought about a data set that had movie descriptions in it, Metadata might include what is the director of the movie, what is the genre of the movie, what year was the movie released. Um, so, so metadata just describes your data set. 
Uh, thanks. So Dominique Dupont is asking, what are the use cases for vector database based on time series instead of text, images, or videos? Yeah, that's that's a great question. And, and that's something that um, at KX you're going to be hearing a lot more about uh, coming within the next couple of months, some, some exciting developments. Uh, but really, um, like I said, the, the core uh, capability of the vector database is similarity searching. Um, so what you can do with time series data, just like you could do with images or text, is do pattern matching with that. So uh, looking at, you know, if you were going to take um, a window of time at market open and then pattern match that to other uh, similar um, situations that have happened in the past, you might be able to do some level of prediction about what's going to come next based, based on that um, pattern matching. Or you could look at like anomaly detection in the case of sensor data where you have a sensor for whatever you want you want to uh, understand. And depending on that data that's coming into the sensor, you might be able to identify when there are anomalies happening, when things are out of the norm. That could go towards uh, detecting problems that are happening, doing some predictive maintenance, things like that. There is another question from Raf. Um, is it possible to retrieve a data point from its embedding? That's actually a good question. I, I don't know 100% the answer to that, but the, the experience that I have is that typically when you're uh, storing your vectors in the vector database, you would also store, or you can also store the original raw data alongside of that in a, a metadata column. So you have access uh, to both the vector embedding itself uh, where you could do your similarity searching on that, and then the original data is also available to you uh, to use as well. Uh, another question from John Thomas. In RAG, can you mash up with public domain a large language models and uh, its underlying data? If so, what is the role of metadata in such a scenario? Um, just a quick second. Paul, did you have uh, a comment? I thought I saw you about to say something. Me? Oh, I just noticed there are uh, questions in the audience as well. So I suggest oh. maybe we interleave them okay. as, a, you know, maybe we take some from, you know, for, uh, online and then in the audience maybe. Uh, okay, that's good. Uh, and on the questions online. Yeah, so please uh, go ahead. Yeah, my question is for Ryan. Um, for the, the KDB, what's the deployment model? Um, it's more like uh, the, the PyCon, which you have in the point to which you can call, or it's more you can deploy it then uh, onto your device or on your machine, or does it support the mobile device and, and deployment? And also, what's the license model? So at this point in time, um, the uh, model can be uh, used in several different ways. Uh, number one, we have the cloud deployment, which is available. And if you go to kdb.ai, you can get started with that right now. Um, it's easy to sign up, quick to get started, lots of example notebooks for you to try. Um, but then server uh, is, is the other method that was actually recently released, uh, I believe within the last month or so, uh, where you can deploy this uh, on your own infrastructure and scale it however you wish. Um, so you have the flexibility, depending on your use case and your preferences, to take it in whatever direction you want to. Uh, licensing, I need to get back to you on. Actually, Ryan, I want to come back to this question, uh, which was just posed about the uh, ability to reconstruct the data, the original data from the embedding. Um, there's actually a bigger problem, uh, which uh, comes from a compliance perspective, from regulatory perspective, and from press perspective. Because if you actually can reconstruct the original data, uh, you actually can get information out, which went into the training, which actually was not necessarily meant for the public domain. So. Well, how can you safeguard against that? And how can you control actually 
uh, whether the information density in the embedding is sufficient to uh, reconstruct potentially confidential detail rather than just um, having a model which reacts in a certain way. Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. And I I don't know that there's necessarily a set answer for that right now. I think it's a it's a bit up in the air. Um, but what I would say, just maybe a getting started point would be when you're uh, building applications, like for example, RAG applications where the user is querying, um, you know, the uh, it's query the user is querying your application with a large language model. So you're querying a large language model and then in the background that reg is happening where you're retrieving relevant information from the vector database and then presenting that to the large language model. Um, one way that I think you could, you could sort of build some boundaries around um, how people are able to answer questions uh, is with uh, some different methods called guardrails. And it's actually, um, it's actually a uh, package that's by NVIDIA Nemo. Um, and they offer basically a way to bring in like a traditional uh, chatbot method where you are uh, defining the flow of conversation uh, with your within your digital assistants, for example. So you could say, uh, you can define the types of questions that people are allowed to ask. So uh, if you did not want people to do what I've heard lately is called jailbreaking, where you're uh, asking the model questions to try to get that underlying information, you could uh, structure it so uh, it would catch if people are trying to do that and uh, not allow them to ask that question. So that's could be one preventative measure, but um, I think that's, Moving forward, that's going to be a big question, especially as uh, companies start introducing like some uh, sensitive data in, into these types of applications. Uh, there's so, another question. Um, um, mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, today's topic is uh, very interesting, and I am mm, more interested in the first topic. Uh, I have a question is, uh, what challenges or considerations should financial technologists be aware of when in incorporating generative, generative AI and the vector databases into their workflows? Uh, so this is a quite big and open question. Thank you. Uh, who is this question for? It's for Ryan. For Ryan, okay. Yeah, and feel free if anyone else wants to chime in, please. Happy to hear your thoughts on it, too. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, I think that's that's a really good question. Um, challenges, you know, I, I think the privacy challenge is, is a big one um, where you need to be really careful about, uh, you know, the data that you're introducing to the large language model in, in a RAG pipeline. Um, but Overall, I think you need to be wary just in general of uh, of the responses that you can get from a large language model because they're it, it's it's generating uh, really token by token or word by word generate the next word predict the next word you don't you can never rely on that to give a safe response one hundred percent so that's why building some guardrails around uh, how people can answer. It can ask questions in the first place could be a, a really a good step in the right direction to start preventing, so, uh, you know, the large language model from giving you weird or inappropriate responses. I actually have a question for all members of this panel. I just wanted to ask each of the panelists if that's okay, if I may ask a question. So uh, maybe name three of the most exciting developments that are currently happening in this space, right, uh, that you are currently working on. I'm just very curious because I know that there have been very exciting things coming out of KDB AI. I know that uh, uh, Dr. Horvath has been working on very interesting applications and filtering. I was just wondering if each of the panelists could just maybe say, uh, you know, just list three things that we're currently working on that we find exciting in the light of the recent changes in uh, AI and recent developments? So um, maybe I, I'm a bit of a party spoiler, but I guess <laughs> a lot of what uh, what we do is, is time series forecasting. So 
Um, it, it's not necessarily the case that I think maybe generative AI will be helpful in this context, but I, I can see there being sure. use cases for generative AI actually in terms of, um, I think I think Blanca might have uh, has, has presented on this actually in the past, and I'll let, let her talk more about this, but in terms of generating time series with certain characteristics, so potentially it could be quite useful for stress testing a model or maybe extending a back test of a model. So I think that could be quite exciting from a time series perspective. Yeah. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll let Blanca probably continue that. Thanks. Um, yeah. So I do find it quite uh, exciting to generate time series data, whether it's with um, you know, all sorts of, of, of different ideas. Uh, generative AI gives us a lot of different tools to to try to do um, these sorts of things. And it has been also mentioned recently that time series uh, generation is a particular challenge. So that's exactly what we're doing. One of the difficulties is actually extracting the information that we see in the data. So that's, um, that's precisely the challenge. I also find, I have to say, um, Maybe this is not fully a, a response to Paul's question, but I also find it very exciting what's happening in the space of large language models. It's not exactly something I'm working on right now, but uh, still, uh, I do see quite a lot of potential. Um, the question is really how to how to um, access that. Um, um, technology in a way that's not too enthusiastic but also not too conservative if you if you see what i mean because i have been speaking to a lot of practitioners who are incredibly excited by the availability of that and there's no doubt this is um <clears throat> a very exciting development however it it bears a lot of dangerous just to blindly go into that um, and identifying those kinds of dangers and identifying what to be mindful of is, I think, a very exciting challenge. What about uh, Olga and Ryan? Is, is Olga still mm -hmm. with us? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I'm here. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. So actually, I also have a bit of a comment on one of the previous questions. Uh, it was about whether one can kind of reproduce the initial data point from its embedded vector, basically. Um, I think that's indeed something very interesting because, of course, um, you know, networks memorizing data is a huge issue. Uh, but just from a purely mathematical perspective, we are talking about the embedding vector. This is typically a low dimensional representation of the kind of initial vector. So I would say that unless you make your embedding model kind of publicly available, that's not that much of an issue. So that's just a comment about that question that came up twice. Um, otherwise, when it comes to what I find exciting in, uh, well, in particular in NLP right now, since that's what I'm focusing on, um, I think that parameter efficient fine tuning of large language models is something that's, you know, it's an active research area and something that's of big practical importance. Um, because unless you have a way to efficiently fine tune a large language model, then you're kind of stuck with the, uh, you know, the giant commercially available ones. Um, and then there are some privacy issues there, especially if you want to allow a third party provider to fine tune on your own proprietary data. Um, you know, that's, that's not necessarily possible, especially if you're dealing with sensitive data, like in healthcare or banking, some other uh, industries. Um, with parameter efficient fine tuning, you can fine tune models much, much faster and much, much cheaper than you would have otherwise. So LoRa is one of the uh, kind of good methods. Um, and then there are some others appearing. So I don't know if maybe Ryan also has any comments on the NLP space. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's a that's a really good point. And, and, uh making uh, the ability to fine tune these large language models easier and faster is gonna be more and more important, I think, moving forward. And, and one of the uh, topics that I'm particularly interested in and, and something that I'm gonna be doing uh, some research into coming up here is uh, the idea of small language models. Uh, 
you know, we've heard a lot about large language models, but we want to be able to also uh, use the power of, of this architecture on our own devices, on our phones, on our computers locally, which will help to protect some of the privacy aspect. Uh, so, I, so I believe that in this year, you're going to see a major rise of, of smaller uh, generative AI models considered uh, as small language models. Uh, so other than that, I did have one more topic that I think uh, I, I'm, well, I know I'm very interested in, but I think it's going to become more and more common and, and maybe become the norm uh, by the end of the year, potentially, is uh, multimodal models. Uh, and you, you've started to see that already with the, the release of Gemini. Uh, if, you, if you were uh, able to watch um, the release of that, it was showing uh, the ability for it to use video and images and text all at the same time and generate very fast responses. Um, so I think that's just the beginning and it's going to continue to grow in that area. I've got a question. Um, yeah, so um, how do you see AI technologies um, like ChatGPT changing the landscape of uh, financial um, decision making and uh, risk assessments in the uh, next uh, five years? Uh, who would like to take the question? <laughs> Um, I can well. I guess it's difficult to know in the next five years, but um, I think one one important area where where ChatGPT and kind of its derivatives could be useful in finance is not necessarily asking ChatGPT questions like predict S and P five hundred. <laughs> Maybe that's too too difficult to question for it to to answer at this stage. But I think it's more in terms of when you're constructing a model to help you in that construction process, um, whether it's using it to help you. You write Python code or, for example, using it to understand certain topics which might be relevant as well. So I saw an interesting um, presentation at, um, a, a while back, basically from Deutsche Bank, and they were using it to pick out keywords, uh, which is quite a difficult uh, task if you're doing it manually. So that's that was more in the construction of the model rather than doing it in a live scenario. So I think that's potentially where it could be useful to, to begin with. Maybe later on it will be used more in a live scenario, uh, potentially in finance. But I think in finance, people tend to be a bit more slow moving in these types of things it would be would be my view. So, But there's definitely, I think, important use cases when it comes to developing models, at, at least at this stage. In five years, maybe we'll, we'll go further down the line and maybe we'll be starting to, to use all this stuff live, on a live basis. I don't know. Thank you. Maybe we want to ask the guys who are connected remotely. No. Who would like to... Uh, well, does anyone else want to comment on this? Yeah, please, yeah. <laughs> Uh, does anyone um, from panelists who would like to comment on this? I think we said what we wanted to say so far, so <laughs> we're good. I, I can comment. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, none of the um, large language model algorithms are actually provably optimal for decision making. Uh, reinforcement learning algorithms are. Right, so if you look at, for example, Q learning, right, it's uh, provably optimal. Or if you look at uh, something like Sarsa, it's provably optimal. I think an interesting area of research is to see if um, LLMs could be combined with reinforcement learning methods to obtain something that is provably optimal. Thank you. Is there any other question? Yeah, please. Um, first of all, thank you very much. It's a really good presentation. Um, for the panelists, um, I just wondered, um, with the advent of, you know, with um, RAG, or is, or is it, yeah, um, RAG, is there still a need to spend as much money in trying to fine tune, uh, you know, um, a normal foundation model to suit a particular customized use case? So if I may comment on that, um, so, in a RAG system in general, there are two language models involved actually. Well, there's one for the synthesis, right? But then there is one for the embeddings, which is 
well, essentially also a language model. So I think there may very well be a lot of use cases when it comes to fine tuning the embedding models, even more so than the ones that are used for synthesis. So I yeah, I, mm -hmm. I completely agree with that. Uh, it's a it's a good question. I think, um, you know, one of the one of the things too with uh, you know fine tuning versus rag is uh, rag is good at introducing uh, relevant data to a large language model, where fine tuning um, could be used to uh, sort of tune a language model to a certain type of task. Um, so if you wanted to tune your language model to do sentiment analysis. For example, um, fine tuning might be a better option than RAG. I think for best results, often you want to actually combine the two, right? right? So well, you, you it, yeah, yeah, you use one as a reasoning engine and then the the other for your knowledge base. Yeah, thank you. Who'd like to comment on this? Okay, good. Um, sorry, probably another question for Ryan, but um, in practice, on a sort of multimodal um, database, how how, you, uh, how would it work? You know, because a string of text is a very different thing to uh, you know an RGB image. Like, how how in practice would such a database work? Yeah, that's that's a, a really good question. And right now. Uh, there's limited options for multimodal embedding models and. And Olga, you may you may have a better uh, view to this than I do, um, but one way you can do it now is use uh, sort of a multi-step process where you could take your images and uh, use a large language model to describe to summarize that image and then store the summary inside your vector database. So you're you're kind of transitioning everything to a single modality. Um, and then doing your rag pipeline, doing your retrieval and presenting. Uh, but then when you present that to a large language model at the end, like you could use a multimodal large language model and present the original raw images to it rather than the summary. So it's kind of like a hack in, in a sense right now. Um, but that would be one way you can do it. And I've done some experimentation with this um, and it, it does work reasonably well to, to do it that way. But you have to keep in mind you're doing that initial call to do the summarization up front, so it's a it's more it's a more expensive method. Yep, indeed, that's one way to go about it. And actually, you can use kind of the same approach to dealing with semi-structured data. So, say you have texts that contain tables in them with structured data. Again, you can create a kind of descriptive summary of a table and embed that. And then at inference time, sure, that is going to be the embedding vector is going to be what you're looking for. But then you will actually take the original table and send that uh, for synthesis. Uh, I've got another question. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> Considering the evolving demands of financial um, software development, um, do you foresee Python continuing to dominate, or um, will other programming languages um, emerge as significant players in the AI era? Um, so uh, I guess I'm biased because I spent most of my time using Python, so maybe I'm not the best person to ask for this, but. Uh, um, I think you do see an evolution over time where people are using different languages, but typically it takes a long time because developers need to learn like kind of the new language. So it's not really the technology that's limiting the the uptake of new languages. It's actually the the developers themselves. So there are promising languages. Like I've, I'm sure a lot of people here have, uh, have looked at Julia as an example as, as kind of a new emerging language. So... Um, I, I guess one thing is that you need to have some sort of uh, base, though, to work upon. So one of the reasons, I guess, Python is popular is because there's so many libraries out there, essentially, that you can call. So it's like a chicken and egg uh, chicken and egg thing as to, to the use cases. But I suspect over time, a lot of the deficiencies of Python in terms of the speed and, and things like that will will kind of kind of get removed. But I don't think 
Python by all means is, is is not a perfect language or anything like that, but its popularity is in sense she self self fulfilling to some extent. So maybe I'll come and um, I'll pass it on to Ryan as well because Ryan represents KX, which uh, produces one of the most uh, popular programming languages in finance, which is Q and uh, KDB. Right. So I would also add that, you know, if you want to understand kind of the dynamics of what's happening to programming languages, you want to go to the um, TOB index, the importance of being earnest index, but it's cross industry. It's not kind of um, finance specific. You will find that currently a number two is C um, a number three is C++, uh, but that's probably also underrepresenting the role of Q specifically in finance. Thank you. Uh, Ryan, would you like to comment on this? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's that's a great description in, in the way that, um, you know, like, like uh, our products, for example, uh, KDB AI, uh, the underlying technology is built with Q. So, so that gives it that speed advantage uh, from the ground up. And, and maybe, maybe one point I'd add is like different use cases have kind of a Kind of a, a different language is kind of most appropriate so it's not necessarily the case that your whole stack will be written in one one specific language so you kind of need to adapt to the use cases so if you have a high frequency tick date sets you kind of you, you need to learn q basically Uh, I have a question from CM Said. Uh, she, ca can you talk more about C++ in this space, how it compares to Python, for example? Maybe that's for me because I just uh, finished giving um, three hours of lectures on C++. Uh, so um, um, C++ is, I mean, Python and C++ basically are based on very much the opposite uh, decisions. Okay, so Python was created for simplicity for making it easy to write programs very fast, for thinking less, right, and kind of getting it right the first time. So it's a prototyping language, right? It's something that you use for research, right? You don't have a lot of time to, you know, to kind of to 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 work on performance and so on. So C++ was created for, okay, so let's make it like really fast. Let's make it very performant and let's create something that is going to run for the next 50 years. Okay, C++ is actually 40 years old, but uh, a lot of the C++ code kind of does run on not just in finance, but like um, in airplanes, on ships, uh, oil rigs, you know, that, that kind of stuff, right? So um, um, satellites, um, spaceships. You know, so that's what C++, well, that's where C++ has its niche. And within finance, it has a niche in um, derivatives pricing. Uh, to a large extent, thanks to Daniel Duffy, it became very popular in uh, finance. Um, and uh, and to a large extent in HFT, but it's quite often it's uh, complemented with uh, Q as well. Uh, there is another question from John Toma regarding LM, LLM uh, versus SLM. Are we talking about the size or about domain specificity? Domain specificity does reduce the size, but are we uh, talking about specialization or size? And is there a Russian dual kind of uh, filial relation between these common offering? Uh, who would like to take this question? Uh, yeah, I can I can chime in on it. Um, yeah, I've, I don't know that there's for sure an answer to that yet, but um, I could see it going both ways. Uh, I could see like having uh, more domain specific small language models on your phone, for example, for maybe text prediction, things like that. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I guess I don't really know, but I think it could go both ways and there'll be experimentation in both of those aspects. So if I may add, I think it's, uh, well, it's definitely the size that's one thing, but also it's um, 
not always about the specific domain as as much as the specific task, because large language models, sometimes great about them is that you can use them for tasks that they were not trained for, right? For small language models, even if like the language itself is not necessarily specific, it might not be specific to finance or healthcare or something like that, but it, it may be trained for a specific task, such as summarization or you know, question answering. Um, and that allows it to be smaller, but still be efficient at what it's trained for. Yeah, please, Paul, go ahead. I just want to add, I mean, uh, this is a bit of a um, uh, shameless plug because all these languages are in the QDC program. All right, so Python, KDB, and C++. So if you guys want to learn all of them, then uh, then uh, QGC is the program for you, because we have people here from the MLI and uh, QGC as well. Yeah, thank you. Uh, there is a question from Raf. Since the scalar project between embeddings is akin to a kernel on data points, would a PCE on embedding be similar to a kernel PCE on data points? Um, that means, do you do dimension reduction on embeddings? I think this is a question for Ryan. Uh, yeah, it's a it's an interesting time for that because we're uh, we're going to be releasing some new developments uh, and features within KDB AI that are directly related to this. Um, so you're going to be seeing some of that coming soon. Uh, but yeah, I think there are some similarities and and. Um, one of the slides that I had presented, uh, one of the aspects of KDB AI is being able to take these vectors and compress them significantly. Um, so you'll be hearing more about that soon. Uh, there is another question for you, Ryan. Uh, have you tried using a code base uh, as a source for RAG? Most examples I've seen uh, uh, was mostly for feeding in PDF documents so that the uh, LLM can help provide answers for company documentation, which wasn't that exciting. So this question from Ole Bu. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, I, I think um, you can, but what I haven't tried it personally, but um, what I would probably do uh, would be use a large language model that has been fine-tuned for coding, like Codex from OpenAI, for example. Um, so yeah, I think it just depends on your use case. You can do RAG in a variety of situations, whether it's just on documentation or on code. Um, so either way. Uh, yes, I have seen that done on code. Um, so you can use that for both kind of questioning the code base, like knowing what's there and for producing code documentation. So yes, you can definitely use it for that. Um, something that is more challenging with code base is the chunking. So you have to chunk your data into pieces before you embed it. So when you're chunking up code, you definitely want to make sure, you know, you do it in a way that is meaningful with regular text. It's easier you can get pretty far by just just chunking it up and kind of equal equally spaced you know sizes yeah that's a great point the chunk the chunking aspect of of really everything i think is is something that needs to be improved especially with code um because you would need to you know, you'd almost need to do it manually um there's not a really a smart way to do it that I, that i'm aware of I think there are some libraries that, uh, at least for Python, I think there are some that will chunk it up, at least like keeping functions together, you know, okay. some classes together. Uh, I think that already exists. I didn't do it myself personally, but uh, yeah, I think that's out there. Uh, thank you, Olga. Um, is there any other questions? Um, maybe every last one, <laughs> one more. So uh, there is often a concern about AI displacing jobs. Um, how do we perceive AI reshaping the uh, employment in the financial sector? Um, and what skills should uh, professionals focus to stay relevant? Uh, who would like to take uh, my question? Um, yeah, I, I think this is a, it's obviously a valid, uh, valid concern. Um, 
like my hope is that uh, AI makes all of us uh, developers and quants more efficient <laughs> so we can do more. Um, but yeah, I, I suppose that there is a risk that, that uh, some tasks will get displaced and, and potentially it could, could have a like a bad effect on, on jobs. Uh, but my hope is that it will make us more efficient and potentially you, you just end up with kind of uh, more hires related to AI. So I guess if you look at a bank, historically it's had lots of uh, manual traders. Uh, but if you go to a bank now, there's not as manual traders, but there's loads of quants and technologies. So maybe it's just a case of the, the roles kind of shifting. So you still need people, but they'll be doing different things. That's my hope. But um, I, I guess you guess you never know. So. Code that uh, you know, I wrote for you the like, integration code that was actually done by Chad GPT. Yeah, but but you had to fix it. <laughs> so, Sorry, which one? <laughs> so Tom, so basically, Paul was doing some some work on the forecasting, and and he used Chat GPT to translate. I think it was R codes. Yeah, R codes to Python, which is pretty impressive, but. Uh, I think there were a few bugs which you had to choose your skill, obviously, to, to fix. So maybe if one day ChatGPT is, ab Chat, Chat is ab absolutely perfect, maybe we'll have more of an issue. So given it's not perfect yet, I think we're still still okay. So uh, th Thank you. Um, is there any other questions? So yeah, uh, related to this uh, question, I when I tested the Chat GPT currently on uh, I work in finance. I'm a, I'm a quant, and uh, actually I I think currently it doesn't understand the context. So it can, for example, implement something if you ask it to implement a model in uh, Monte Carlo or something. But I think that there must be quants to give it the context. To do some uh, to do uh, the work, and uh, I think maybe in the long term it will replace uh, a good part. But uh, for now, I don't think it is. Uh, I, I did some tests. It it, it doesn't uh, actually answer accurately to the question. So this is what I think. Um, yeah, this is my view. I think the biggest problem with LLMs right now is not only that you know they fail, but the fact that it's very hard to tell when they're failing. Um, that's something called hallucination, right? When they just produce nonsensical answers. Uh, but because they're trained for language modeling, they're trained to produce text that sounds realistic. So it's going to you know very confidently write code for you, make models for you, but whether that's something that's actually reliable, you know, you do need a human for that. So I think at least for now, uh, a lot of people are kind of not uh, as th a lot of people's jobs are not as threatened as it might seem. Which means this is your chance to sign up for the QDC and MLI certifications <laughs> before ChatGPT takes over. You still have the time, and I think it's a good opportunity. That was the best answer this evening. <laughs> uh, can we take another question? Uh, okay, I don't have to have specific question. I am a program leader of big data from university, but I have some specific comments regarding large uh, language models and how to use it. And they're very positive because uh, the jobs placement still will grow in this area and in any IT area because to evaluate results that we receive from large language models, we, can, we have to be specialists in this area. Because of multiple hallucination, if you're not specialized, you can't understand the output of this language model on the high level. That's why, yes, we still need specialists. We still need uh, uh, a lot of training for them to understand, yes, all this area and all outputs given by AI generative. That's why it's a good prediction for the future. 
Yes, just we need to continue to grow our knowledge level. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, there is a question from John Thomas. Uh, will there be a new domain of AI uh, ML cognitive biases that uh, then, uh, then can be exploited in the uh, high stakes finance domain? Yeah. Paul, can uh, I easier? redirect this uh, question to the website less wrong? Um, which considers uh, cognitive biases and uh, and logical fallacies, but I mean, on the, I, I think definitely yes, right? Because um, I think what's actually very interesting, right? You cannot actually have natural language without cognitive biases and uh, logical fallacies, which is actually quite interesting, yeah. Because I mean, like I think in the paragraph I have just uttered, there must have been quite a few of them already, so. Um, this is, I think, a somewhat uh, interesting and disturbing direction that uh, if you're using LLMs, you should be aware of. But uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think it's an interesting topic, right? And uh, Wikipedia has a very good list of cognitive biases and logical fallacies, so you can uh, look it up. And I, I mean, when they are applied to finance, they're not different to when you know, when they're just applied as, you know, in general life, but you can also look at um, the uh, prospect theory by Kahneman and Tversky. Thank you. Uh, would like to comment on this? Okay, so um, is there any other questions? Okay, th so thank you so much. So um, as we conclude our panel discussion, I would like to thank our um, panelists for their invaluable insights uh, and our audience for their engaging uh, participation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.